Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. Today's lecture is a series of illustrated examples about AC power calculation. Recall during the AC power lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we examine the relationship of apparent, real, and reactive power when learn to calculate these quantities on an introductory level. Today's lecture is merely an extension of this topic by way of a series of practical examples. Mastery of AC power necessitates active participation on your part. And as such, I'm encouraging you to please pause the lecture when asked to do so and attempt the example problems on your own. If your answers do not match those illustrated, by all means, feel free to rewind the lecture and correct any mistakes you may have made. Before we begin with the illustrated example problems, let's perform a brief review of AC power calculation and take an inventory of the tools we have at our disposal. For the purposes of this review, let's use some general plots of voltage across and current through an unknown impedance Z. It is assumed voltage and current have the same frequency, however, there may or may not exist some phase shift between them. For the purposes of this general diagram, note current appears to lead voltage, although this needn't always be the case. Current could just as easily lag voltage or be perfectly in phase with it. Recall that instantaneous power is the product of instantaneous voltage and instantaneous current. Given voltage and current are time variant sinusoidal functions, instantaneous power will exhibit some identifiable characteristics. First, if there exists a phase shift between voltage and current, note there will be momentary periods of positive power as well as momentary periods of negative power. Positive voltage times positive current yields positive power. Positive voltage times negative current yields negative power. Negative voltage times negative current yields positive power. And finally, negative voltage times positive current yields negative power. Positive power is defined as an element absorbing, consuming, or dissipating power, whereas negative power is defined as an element supplying, returning, or providing power. This implies that the element in question is slightly reactive in nature in that at times it consumes power from the source and other times returns it back to the source. Second, the instantaneous power function appears to exhibit quasi-sinusoidal properties and that it is a time-variant sinusoidal waveform with twice the frequency of voltage and current, only it's shifted vertically. This implies that elements in AC circuits do not experience constant power, as in DC circuits, but rather experience periodic bursts of power over time. While calculable by individuals well-versed in math and with ample amounts of time on their hand, the specifics of the instantaneous power function is of dubious utility, and users often content themselves with average behavior over time. Given the time variant power function is symmetric in nature, one can draw a horizontal line running right through the middle of it, where this horizontal line can be thought of as the average power figure. In this hypothetical scenario, our average value, whatever it might be, appears to be above the horizontal axis. This makes perfect sense given the longer and larger periods of positive power seem to outweigh the somewhat briefer and smaller periods of negative power. It can be therefore said that over time, the slowed despite experiencing regular momentary periods of negative power, on average consumes, dissipates, or absorbs a measurable amount of positive power. This average power figure is known as the real, actual, or true power, and it's symbolized as a capital P and measured in units of watts. Real power is that amount of power actually put to work by the element in question, either heating up a space if it's a heater, turning a load with a specific torque and rotational speed if it's a motor, or some other measurable function. Real power, because it accounts for the amount of phase shift between voltage and current, shifts up or down based on the proportional distribution of positive and negative power over time. If, however, we assume there to be no phase shift between voltage and current, we obtain a similar time variant power function, only this idealized scenario is entirely above the horizontal axis, meaning power is always positive. If we were to average this imagined state, we would attain a figure known as the apparent power value, symbolized by a capital S, and measured in units of volt amperes, or VA. If apparent power is to be likened to an ideal scenario in which voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another, and all power is positive, it's almost like real power is what's left over after phase shift effects are accounted for. In keeping with this observation, one can think of a third type of power, known as reactive power, symbolized as a capital Q and measured in units of volt amperes reactive, or VARs, where reactive power is that power not dissipated, but rather cyclically exchanged with the power supply. 
Reactive power Q is somewhat difficult to visualize graphically, whereas real and apparent power can be thought of as simple straight line averages running right down the middle of their respective plots. I like to think of reactive power as those periods of negative power and their matching positive periods cyclically exchanged between the circuit and the source. Now that we've reviewed the basic concepts of AC power, let's review the means of representing apparent, real, and reactive power. In summary, real and reactive power are quite literally different dimensions of apparent power when expressed as a complex number, where real power P is the real horizontal X component and reactive power Q is the imaginary vertical Y component, expressed using rectangular format S equals P plus or minus JQ. Note the overbar indicating that apparent power S is in actuality a complex number. Alternatively, apparent power can be represented using polar format with a magnitude S. Note the lack of an overbar indicating this is a magnitude only and a direction, theta S. Given our previous experience with complex numbers, you are no doubt capable of converting between these two forms with a little difficulty. Given the polar form of apparent power, S at an angle theta S, one can determine the individual rectangular components as follows. Real power, P, the real horizontal X component is the apparent power of magnitude S times the cosine of the apparent power angle, theta S. P equals S cosine theta S. Reactive power, Q, the imaginary vertical Y component is the apparent power of magnitude S times the sine of the apparent power angle, theta S. Q equals S sine theta S. Coming at this from the other direction, Given the rectangular form of apparent power, one can determine the individual polar components. The magnitude of apparent power S is the square root of the sum of the squares of real and reactive power. S equals square root P squared plus Q squared. Finally, the apparent power angle theta S is the inverse tangent of the reactive power Q over the real power P. Before we move on, allow me to remind you about a brief note about polarity. Historically, inductive circuits in which current lags voltage are defined as having positive reactive power or absorbing reactive power. In contrast, capacitive circuits in which current leads voltage are defined as having negative reactive power or supplying reactive power. This terminology kind of annoys me because reactive power in both cases is neither truly absorbed nor truly supplied, but rather cyclically exchanged. I don't like this any more than you, but we might as well get used to it. Let's now review the numerous methods of directly calculating AC power. Some of these methods necessitate the use of complex numbers, and others don't. I find me using a mix of these methods to be the wisest course of action. Before we examine these techniques employing complex numbers, allow me to remind you that these equations are valid for one condition and one condition only. This condition being that only the relative phase shift between voltage and current matters. Ask yourself the simple question, does current lead or lag voltage, and if so, by how much? As a demonstration of this simple but important process, consider voltage expressed as a phase equivalent as 60 volts at an angle of positive 30 degrees, and current expressed as a phase equivalent as 200 milliampers at an angle of positive 10 degrees. Despite the use of some external absolute reference, it should be obvious that there is a relative phase shift of 30 minus 10 or 20 degrees between voltage and current, and current can be said to lag voltage by 20 degrees. Therefore, for the purposes of AC power calculation, it can be rightly said that voltage expressed as a phasor equivalent is 60 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, and current expressed as a phasor equivalent is 200 milliampers at an angle of negative 20 degrees. Don't make relative phase shift hard. Just look at the phasor diagram. For the purposes of AC power calculation, current must be referenced with respect to voltage. I'll only say this about a million times, and some of you will still get this wrong. Don't let this be you. With this important condition established, apparent power, expressed as a complex number, is the complex conjugate of the product of voltage and current phasor equivalents. Apparent power is also the complex conjugate of the current phasor equivalent squared times the complex impedance. Finally, apparent power is also the complex conjugate of the voltage phasor equivalent squared divided by the complex impedance. You should be able to manipulate these equations with ease to solve for the quantity of interest.
Note the complex conjugate operation for all these formulas accounts for the sign of reactive power. Finally, I must again remind you that these equations making use of phasor equivalence are valid for one condition and one condition only. This condition being that only the relative phase shift between voltage and current matters. Ask yourself the question, does current lead or lag voltage, and if so, by how much? The other calculation methods that don't employ complex numbers aren't nearly as complicated. However, they're not nearly as informative. Apparent power magnitude. Note the lack of an overbar indicating this is a scalar or a magnitude quantity only is the effective or RMS voltage times the effective or RMS current. Apparent power magnitude is also the effective RMS current value squared times the impedance magnitude. Finally, apparent power magnitude is also the effective RMS voltage squared divided by the impedance magnitude. You note these methods are essentially dumbed down versions of those employing complex numbers and yield an apparent power magnitude only and not a direction. While not nearly as informative, they're effective and efficient means of getting results quickly. A related figure, power factor, is the ratio of real power over apparent power. A simple algebraic rearrangement of this equation demonstrates that real power equals apparent power magnitude times power factor. Used in this manner, power factor is in effect a cheat code that extracts the real power component from apparent power without the use of complex numbers. Power factor is often a pre-calculated quantity that is written directly on a motor nameplate. Given our previous understanding of complex numbers, it should be noted that power factor is in effect a stand-in for the cosine of the apparent power angle when apparent power is represented as a complex number. Power factor equals cosine of theta s. Finally, note that the angle of apparent power, theta s, is equal to the impedance angle, theta z, and if you've referenced current with respect to voltage as required, theta s is the inverse or negation of current phase shift, theta i. This fact makes an extremely convenient check on your work. All right, I do believe we've performed a complete inventory of the concepts, the means of representing, and the means of calculating AC power. We're well prepared to start this series of illustrated example problems. Before we rush off into the bush though and start shooting wildly at anything that moves, let's form a clear image of our prey. Recall that current can really only lead or lag voltage by a relative 90 degrees. This fact establishes a spectrum of clear expectations. In this single scenario, in which voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another, all of apparent power is being directed towards real power because none of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. When voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another, real power equals apparent power magnitude and reactive power equals zero. P equals S and Q equals zero. At the two opposite extremes, in which there is a full 90 degree phase shift between voltage and current, either leading or lagging, all of apparent power is being directed towards a reactive interchange because none of it is being directed towards real power. Real power equals zero and apparent power equals the absolute value of reactive power. P equals zero, Q equals S. Note inductive occasions in which current lags voltage are defined as having positive reactive power, and capacitive occasions in which current leads voltage are defined as having negative reactive power. In between these extremes is where the magic happens. Note as current increasingly leads or increasingly lags voltage, less apparent power will be directed towards real power since more of it will be directed towards a reactive interchange. Conversely, as current becomes more in phase with voltage, more of apparent power is directed towards real power because less of it will be directed towards a reactive interchange. A general purpose graph of apparent, real, and reactive power illustrates how the degree of phase shift between voltage and current affects how apparent power is apportioned between real and reactive power. No apparent power remains unaffected by phase shift. Real power peaks and reactive power is zero when there is no phase shift between voltage and current. The absolute value of reactive power peaks and real power is zero when there's a full 90 degree phase shift between voltage and current, either leading or lagging. Again, as current increasingly leads or increasingly lags voltage, less apparent power will be directed towards real power since more of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Conversely, as current becomes more in phase with voltage,
more of apparent power will be directed towards real power because less of it will be directed towards a reactive interchange. Use these range of expectations to guide your hunt. If you ever observe something outside this range, you are straight up doing it wrong. Here's a batch of very basic power equation manipulations necessitating minimal setup. Given the following information, solve for the desired properties. You'll note voltage and current have already been expressed as phasor equivalents, where current has already been referenced with respect to voltage and any complex impedance has already been calculated. Express all answers using proper engineering units. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. For our first example problem, we've been given a voltage of 24 volts at an angle of 0 degrees and a current of 380 milliampers at an angle of negative 23.4 degrees and are being asked to solve for the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. I find drawing the phasor diagram of voltage and current an invaluable visual aid when performing AC power calculations. Given current appears to lag voltage, we're most likely dealing with a slightly inductive impedance, and as such, we should expect our resultant real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude and reactive power to be positive. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be 9.1 volt amperes at an angle of positive 23.4 degrees. When resolved into its real and reactive components, we found real power to be 8.4 watts and reactive power to be positive 3.6 vars. The real power of 8.4 watts is that amount of power actually dissipated by the element in question, whereas the reactive amount of 3.6 vars is that amount cyclically absorbed and then returned or exchanged with the power supply. As expected, real power is less than apparent power and reactive power is positive given the slightly inductive nature of the impedance in that current lags voltage. Again, I find taking the time to draw out the spatial relationship of apparent, real, and reactive power an invaluable visual aid when performing AC power calculations. Note if one was to express apparent power magnitude only, one would simply say 9.1 volt amperes and leave off the angle. The angle is often indirectly packaged as power factor, where power factor is the cosine of the apparent power angle. In this case, power factor is equal to 0.92 expressed to the hundredths place. Power factor is additionally the ratio of real over apparent power, which yields the same value. Most likely, we're correct. For our second example problem, we've been given a voltage of 90 volts at an angle of 0 degrees, an impedance of 150 ohms at an angle of negative 50 degrees, and are being asked to solve for the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. Given this impedance appears to be somewhat capacitive because of the negative impedance angle, we should expect our resultant real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude and our reactive power to be negative. Let's see if this is the case. We could use Ohm's law to solve for the current. However, we can also use an alternate version of the AC power formula. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage squared divided by impedance. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be 54 volt amperes at an angle of negative 50 degrees. When apparent power is resolved into its real and reactive components, we find real power to be 34.7 watts, reactive power to be negative 41.4 vars. As expected, real power is less than apparent power and reactive power is negative given the somewhat capacitive nature of this impedance. Given this capacitive nature, we might expect current to lead voltage. A manipulation of the AC power formula or Ohm's law solving for current verifies this hypothesis. If apparent power is equal to the complex conjugate of voltage times current, current equals the complex conjugate of apparent power over voltage. Substituting in our given values, we find current to be 600 milliampers at an angle of positive 50 degrees. Current does indeed lead voltage as we anticipated. For our third example problem, we've been given a current of 1.6 amps at an angle of negative 34 degrees, an impedance of 75 ohms at an angle of positive 34 degrees, and are being asked to solve for the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. In this scenario, we've been explicitly told that current phase shift has been referenced with respect to voltage as required. Given the impedance appears to be slightly inductive by nature, we should expect our result in real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude 
and our reactive power assigned to be positive. Let's see if this is the case. As previously, we could use Ohm's law to solve for the voltage. However, we can use an alternate version of the AC power formula. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of current squared times impedance. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be 192 volt amperes at an angle of positive 34 degrees. When resolved into its real and reactive components, we find real power to be 159.2 watts and reactive power to be positive 107.4 vars. As expected, real power is less than apparent power and reactive power is positive given the slightly inductive nature of this impedance. For our fourth example problem, we've been given an effective voltage value of 208 volts, an apparent power magnitude of 249.6 volt amperes, a power factor of 0.87, and are being asked to solve for the effective value of current and real power. Additionally, we're being asked to solve for the phasor equivalent of current, reactive power, and complex impedance. Finally, we're given a clue that current is lagging voltage, but we don't know by how much. This scenario is especially well suited to using a mixture of techniques, both foregoing and employing the use of complex numbers. Given current is lagging voltage, we're most likely dealing with a slightly inductive impedance, and as such, we should expect our resultant real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude and our reactive power polarity to be positive. Let's see if this is the case. Since we're not given phase shift or angles up front, let's start off employing the techniques foregoing the use of complex numbers. Given apparent power magnitude is a product of voltage and current effective values, we can rearrange this equation to solve for current, where current is apparent power of magnitude divided by voltage. Substituting in our given values, we find current to be 1.2 amps. We know current to be lagging, but right now we don't know by how much. Given power factors, the ratio of real over apparent power of magnitude, we can rearrange this equation to solve for real power, where real power is apparent power of magnitude times power factor. Substituting in our given values, we find real power to be roughly 217.2 watts. Where to now? Honestly, we're kind of dead in the water if we don't use angles. However, we're open to all types of further exploration if we employ complex numbers. Let's solve for reactive power. With our understanding that apparent power is in reality not just a magnitude only, but rather a rectangular complex number with both real and imaginary components. And given we know the magnitude and the real component, we should be able to solve for the unknown imaginary component using several methods. Here's one way of calculating reactive power. Given the magnitude of apparent power equals the sum of the squares of real and reactive power, we should be able to algebraically solve for reactive power. Doing so yields reactive power equals the square root of the differences of the squares of apparent and real power. Q equals square root S squared minus P squared. Substituting in our given values yields a reactive power of positive 123.1 bars. Given we know current to lag voltage, we're certain the sign of reactive power is positive. Here's yet another means of calculating reactive power. Reactive power equals apparent power magnitude times the sine of the angle. Q equals S sine theta S. We have the magnitude of apparent power, but right now we're not directly aware of the apparent power angle. This being said, we do know power factor to be 0.87 and can use this fact to determine the angle. Power factor is the cosine of the apparent power angle. Solving for the angle by taking the inverse cosine of power factor, and substituting in our given values yields an angle of roughly 29.5 degrees. Note the apparent power angle is assumed to be positive since we're obviously dealing with an inductive impedance because current lags voltage. Substituting in this apparent power angle and apparent power magnitude into the reactive power formula, Q equals S sine theta S, again yields a reactive power figure of roughly positive 123.1 vars. Similarly, there are several ways of solving for phasor equivalent current and complex impedance. Let's solve for the phasor equivalent of current first. We already know that current's effective magnitude to be 1.2 amps from our previous calculation. All we need now is the degree of phase shift. Let's use the simple fact that we know when current is referenced with respect to voltage, the phase shift angle will be the inverse of the apparent power angle. Our current phasor equivalent is therefore equal to 1.2 amps 
at an angle of negative 29.5 degrees. As can be expected, current lags voltage. The complex impedance can be solved for via an Ohm's law manipulation or through manipulation of the power equations. Substituting our given values using either technique yields a complex impedance of roughly 173.3 ohms at an angle of positive 29.5 degrees. Again, note that the impedance angle is the same as the apparent power angle and the inverse of the current phase shift when voltage is employed as a reference. All is good. Try not to get discouraged by the variety of techniques I'm demonstrating. Take heart that with so many techniques at your disposal, at least one of them will work. My advice is to familiarize yourself with all these techniques and then just get good at the ones you like. You'll note it's sometimes worth the effort to forcibly reformat everything into phasor equivalents and complex numbers right up front if you're ever tasked with a larger problem. However, you can use the shortcut techniques if you need just a simple single value. Finally, for our fifth example problem, we've been given a voltage of 9.8 volts at an angle of 0 degrees and a current of 40 milliampers at an angle of positive 90 degrees and are being asked to solve the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. Given current appears to lead voltage by a full 90 degrees, we're most likely dealing with a purely capacitive impedance. And as such, we should expect our result in real power to be zero, the absolute value of reactive power equal to apparent power and reactive power to be negative. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be 392 millivolt amperes at an angle of negative 90 degrees. When resolved into its real and reactive components, we found real power to be zero watts and reactive power to be negative 392 millivars. As expected, real power is zero and all of apparent power is being directed towards reactive interchange. Finally, the sign of reactive power is negative given the purely capacitive nature of the impedance and that current leads voltage by a full 90 degrees. You note that when illustrated graphically in the AC power domain, there is no real horizontal x component and solely a negative imaginary vertical y component, meaning all of apparent power is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Therefore, the apparent power vector perfectly overlaps the reactive power component. Know how the apparent power angle accounts for the polarity of reactive power. Reactive power has a magnitude of negative 392 millivolt amperes because apparent power has a magnitude of positive 392 millivolt amperes, only it's pointed at a direction of negative 90 degrees. You'll note for occasions in which there exists solely real or solely reactive power of one flavor or another, apparent power magnitude will equal that of the absolute value of this sole dimension. As examples of this division of apparent power into solely real or solely reactive components, consider a resistor experiencing 200 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of zero degrees, 200 watts of which is being dissipated as real power since none of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. In this case, the apparent power vector perfectly overlaps the real power component. Similarly, consider an inductor experiencing 40 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of positive 90 degrees, zero watts of which is being dissipated as real power since positive 40 volt amperes of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Although I personally loathe this terminology, you might hear people saying that this inductor is absorbing 40 vars of reactive power. In this case, the apparent power vector perfectly overlaps the positive reactive power component. Finally, consider a capacitor experiencing 25 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of negative 90 degrees, zero watts of which is being dissipated as real power, since negative 25 vars is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Again, I personally loathe this terminology, but you might hear people saying that this capacitor is supplying 25 vars of reactive power. In this case, the apparent power vector perfectly overlaps the negative reactive power component with a negative 90 degree angle accounts for polarity. Moving on, you'll note this first batch of AC power example problems use voltage as the reference from which current is measured. While referencing current with respect to voltage is a commonly accepted practice and an absolute necessity for AC power calculations, this isn't always the case. As such, 
Let's step this up a notch and try some example problems, including scenarios in which some other outside absolute reference is employed. Given the following information, solve for the desired properties. As previously, you'll note voltage and current have already been expressed as phasor equivalents, and any complex impedances have already been calculated. Express all answers using proper engineering units. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. For our first example problem, we've been given a voltage phasor equivalent of 86 volts at an angle of positive 17 degrees and a current phasor equivalent of 80 milliampers at an angle of positive 35 degrees and are being asked to solve for the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. Despite employing some absolute external reference, there appears to be a 35 minus 17 or 18 degree relative phase shift between voltage and current and current can be said to lead voltage by a relative 18 degrees. Don't make relative phase shift a big deal. Just look at the phasor diagram. When expressed using voltage as a reference, the voltage phasor equivalent is 86 volts at an angle of zero degrees, and the current phasor equivalent is 80 milliampers at an angle of positive 18 degrees. This is the format we require for our parent power calculations and anything else simply will not work. Given current appears to lead voltage, we're most likely dealing with a slightly capacitive impedance, and as such, we should expect our resultant real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude and our reactive power to be negative. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be roughly 6.9 volt amperes at an angle of negative 18 degrees. When resolved into its real and reactive components, we find real power to be roughly 6.5 watts and reactive power to be roughly negative 2.1 volt amperes reactive. As expected, real power is less than apparent power magnitude and reactive power is negative given the slightly capacitive nature of the impedance in that current leads voltage. For a second example problem, we've been given a voltage of 120 volts at an angle of positive 22 degrees and a current of 800 milliampers also at an angle of positive 22 degrees are being asked to solve for the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. Note both voltage and current have the same phase shift of positive 22 degrees. This implies voltage and current are perfectly in phase with one another, and there is a zero degree relative phase shift between them. When expressed using voltage as the reference, the voltage phasor equivalent is 120 volts at an angle of zero degrees, and the current phasor equivalent is 800 milliampers at an angle of zero degrees. Given current appears to be perfectly in phase with voltage, we're most likely dealing with a purely resistive impedance, and as such, we should expect all of apparent power to be directed towards real power, and none of it towards a reactive interchange. Let's see if this is the case. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we find our apparent power to be 96 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. When apparent power is resolved into its real and reactive components, we find real power to be 96 watts and reactive power to be zero bars. As expected for this purely resistive element, all of apparent power is being directed towards real power and none of it towards a reactive interchange. As we previously discussed, the apparent power vector perfectly overlaps the real power component. For our third example problem, we've been given a voltage of 105 volts at an angle of negative 14 degrees and an impedance of 280 ohms at an angle of positive 40 degrees and are being asked to solve the result in apparent, real, and reactive power. Given the impedance appears to be somewhat inductive because of the positive impedance angle, we should expect our result in real power to be less than our apparent power magnitude and our reactive power polarity to be positive. Let's see if this is the case. We could use Ohm's law to solve the current. However, we can use an alternate version of the AC power formula. Apparent power is the complex conjugate of voltage squared divided by impedance. When voltage is employed as the reference as required, the voltage phasor equivalent is 105 volts at an angle of zero degrees. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power to be 39.4 volt amperes at an angle of positive 40 degrees. When apparent power is resolved into its real and reactive components, we find real power to be 30.2 watts and reactive power to be positive 25.3 vars. As expected, real power is less than apparent power and reactive power is positive 
given the somewhat inductive nature of the impedance. Given this inductive nature, we might expect current to lag voltage by a relative 40 degrees. A simple manipulation of the power equation, or just as easily Ohm's law, supports this hypothesis. Solving for current and substituting in our given values, we find current to be 375 milliampers at an angle of negative 40 degrees using either method. Keep in mind, this calculated phase shift is only relative in nature. If we employ the previously agreed upon absolute reference, such that voltage is 105 volts at an angle of negative 14 degrees, current using this same reference would be 375 milliampers at an angle of negative 54 degrees. Again, don't make relative phase shift such a big deal. Just look at the phaser diagram. Regardless of the reference employed, current can still be said to lag voltage by a relative 40 degrees. All right, let's end this lecture with a couple of quick scenarios examining the practical applications of AC power calculations. First, let's consider an industrial AC motor. Ordinarily, most industrial motors run off three-phase AC. However, let's concern ourselves solely with a single winding. We'll examine the details of three-phase AC and industrial three-phase AC motors in later lectures. Let's say the single winding experiences a voltage differential of 120 volts, and while the motor is unloaded, the single winding draws, let's say, 507 milliampers of current at a power factor of 0.17. An example of an unloaded motor would be a free-spinning grinder before the grinder makes contact with the workpiece, where rotational speed is pretty high, however the twisting force or torque produced by the rotating shaft is relatively low. If, however, the motor is loaded, let's say the grinder actually makes contact with a workpiece and the twisting force or torque produced by the rotating shaft is relatively high, the motor winding draws 994 milliampers of current at a power factor of 0.84. It should be noted that motor windings, note the dramatic emphasis of the term winding, are primarily inductive in nature. Although it's not ordinarily explicitly mentioned, it is assumed that all motors are always inductive in nature, and you can always anticipate current to lag voltage. See if you can determine the apparent, real, and reactive power consumed by this motor winding in both the unloaded and the loaded condition, and then compare the two conditions. You should notice something very interesting in this comparison. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Long story short, when the motor is unloaded and just free spinning, not a lot of real work is being done. This is evident by the piss poor power factor of 0.17. Really the only thing the 507 milliampers of current drawn from the power supply in the unloaded condition is doing is establishing a magnetic field and maybe accounting for a tiny amount of real power loss due to heat or friction. In the loaded condition, however, a substantial amount of work is being done, evident by the much larger power factor of 0.84. However, the motor still requires a magnetic field to operate. Thus, we'd still expect a portion of power to be directed towards a reactive interchange. Let's examine the unloaded condition first. Apparent power magnitude is voltage times current. Substituting our given values, we find apparent power magnitude to be roughly 60.8 volt amperes. This really illustrates the origin of the term apparent power. If we are unaware of phase shift between voltage and current, relied solely on the effective value of voltage and current, we'd be under the false impression that this motor was apparently consuming 60.8 watts of real power. The reality is far, far from the truth. Real power is apparent power magnitude times power factor. In the unloaded condition, an extremely lame 0.17. Substituting in our given values yields a real power consumption of only 10.3 watts. This is the small amount of real power accounting for frictional heat losses when the unopposed motor is just free spinning and not doing any actual work. As we anticipated, real power in the unloaded condition is relatively small, meaning only a small portion of power the motor is apparently consuming is being directed towards actual work, and a vast majority of it will be directed towards a reactive interchange characteristic of primarily inductive elements like motor windings.
Let's solve for reactive power using one of our previously derived methods. Reactive power Q equals the square root of the differences of the squares of apparent power S and real power P. Substituting our given values yields a reactive power of roughly 60 volt amperes. Given we know current to lag voltage, we're certain the sign of reactive power is positive. As we anticipated in the unloaded condition, a large majority of the power the motor is apparently consuming is being directed towards the reactive interchange and very little of it towards actual work. Granted, we solve for these quantities without using angles or complex numbers. However, we could assemble apparent power as a complex number in rectangular format as 10.3 plus J60, and then convert it into polar format as 60.8 volt amperes at an angle of positive 80.2 degrees. Again, I find these plots extremely gratifying as they clearly illustrate the spatial relationship of apparent, real, and reactive power. Let's now examine the apparent, real, and reactive power for the loaded condition using the alternate technique, notably by employing complex numbers and angles. If you wanted to, you could use the same techniques as we did in the unloaded condition, but let's try something new for the sake of variety. As previously, apparent power magnitude is voltage times current. Substituting in our given values, we find apparent power magnitude to be 119.3 volt amperes. Compared to the unloaded condition, we're apparently consuming more power. This should be expected given the grinder is making sparks fly. Where, however, is all that apparent power being directed? Real or reactive? To answer this question using complex numbers, we can solve for the apparent power angle by taking the inverse cosine of power factor. Substituting in our given values yields an angle of roughly 32.9 degrees. Note the apparent power angle is assumed to be positive since we're obviously dealing with an inductive impedance because current lags voltage. The apparent power, expressed as a complex number in polar format, is therefore 119.3 volt amperes at an angle of positive 32.9 degrees. Thus far, we've been resolving apparent power into its real and reactive components the hard way. Let's use our scientific calculator to perform this task in a far more efficient manner by converting this polar number to one making use of a rectangular format. Doing so yields 100.2 plus J 64.7. The real horizontal X component is real power. Real power is roughly 100.2 watts. The imaginary vertical Y component is reactive power. Reactive power is roughly 64.7 VARs. As we anticipated, real power in the loaded condition is much larger, almost 10 times larger than the unloaded condition, meaning a larger proportion of apparent power is now being directed towards actual work. Note, however, the motor still consumes a measurable amount of reactive power in the loaded condition. In fact, despite a dramatic increase in real power consumption, the reactive power consumption remained relatively constant only increasing ever so slightly. This is a classic characteristic of induction motors. A plot of real and reactive power input on the vertical axis as a function of mechanical power output on the horizontal axis illustrates this behavior quite succinctly. As mechanical power requirement, i.e. doing real labor, increases, the reactive power requirement remains relatively constant for the entire range. Whereas real power consumption almost linearly increases. This is to imply that induction motors consume real power roughly linearly proportional to the applied load, but at all times must consume a relatively constant amount of reactive power simply to keep the motor spinning. We'll examine this feature and much, much more about induction motors in later lectures. All right, one more illustrated example problem before I cut you loose this time featuring a transformer. A transformer is an electrical device that in summary steps up or steps down applied voltage. We'll examine the inner workings of transformers in later lectures, but let's dispel a common misconception about transformers using our newfound knowledge of AC power calculation. Since transformers contain no moving parts, a common assumption is that they are nearly 100% efficient. This isn't really true, as we'll soon demonstrate. Consider a transformer modeled as a black box, where incoming voltage and current of a specific magnitude is transformed, hence the name, into voltage and current of another magnitude. If a transformer was truly 100% efficient, 
power input should equal power output. Let's see if this is the case. Consider a transformer being supplied 120 volts AC from a residential outlet. The transformer is being used to step down the supply voltage to 24 volts AC to power some consumer electronics device, either a lamp, a computer, or a battery charger, or something else that necessitates a smaller operating voltage. Let's say the device in question is modeled as a purely resistive load of 5 ohms. An ammeter at the output of the transformer indicates the device draws 4 point amps of current. Let's calculate the apparent power output of the transformer. The apparent power output of the transformer is the complex conjugate of the voltage times the current. Given this is a purely resistive load, there will be no phase shift between voltage and current, and all of apparent power will be directed towards real power and none of it towards a reactive interchange. Substituting in our given values and solving for the real and reactive components, we find this to be the truth. Of the 115.2 volt amperes at an angle of zero being output by the transformer, all of it is being directed towards 115.2 watts of real power, and none of it is being directed towards a reactive interchange. Here's where our earlier assumption might prove false. If a transformer was truly 100% efficient, what's the power input to the transformer, and what is the current drawn from the 120 volt source? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have come up with the following results. If the transformer was truly 100% efficient, power in should equal power out. Given power output has been calculated to be 115.2 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees, one might expect power input for a 100% efficient device to be also 115.2 volt amperes at an angle of zero degrees. Let's now solve for the current drawn from the residential supply. Apparent power to the input transformer is the complex conjugate of the voltage times the current. Solving for current and substituting in our given values, again assuming there to be no phase shift between voltage and current given the purely resistive load at the output, we find current to be 960 milliamperes at an angle of zero degrees. In summary, power in equals power out, not only in magnitude, but also flavor. Note in the idealized 100% efficient scenario, power input has the same characteristics of power output and that all of it is real and none of it reactive. Again, this hypothetical scenario is what we'd expect of a perfectly 100% efficient transformer. Power in equals power out, no change in flavor. Let's now examine a non-ideal transformer and see if it matches these lofty expectations. As previously, an ammeter on the output indicates our 5 ohm resistive load draws exactly 4.8 amps, perfectly in phase with the 24 volt AC output of the transformer. As previously, the power output of the transformer is 115.2 volt amperes, all of which is being directed towards 115.2 watts of real power and none of it towards a reactive interchange. This time, our non-ideal transformer is observed to draw not 960 milliamperes as previously, but rather one amp from the 120 volt AC residential supply. Additionally, this current appears to slightly lag supply voltage by let's say seven degrees. Current therefore can be represented using a phasor equivalent as one amp at an angle of negative seven degrees. Given we've observed a slightly higher current draw and slight phase shift between voltage and current in the ideal scenario, we might expect a tiny portion of apparent power to be directed towards a reactive power interchange. What is the power input to this non-ideal transformer and is all of it being put to good use? By all means, pause the lecture and think about this. If you're tracking, you should have come up with the following results. Apparent power input to the transformer is the complex conjugate of the voltage times the current. Substituting our given values and solving for the real and reactive components, we find our expectations to be true. The non-ideal transformer seems to be consuming 120 volt amperes of apparent power, of which 119.1 watts is being directed towards real power and 14.6 volt amperes reactive is being directed towards a reactive interchange. How efficient is this transformer? Think about it, 115.2 watts of real power is being put to actual use. How much real power is it drawing from the source?
might rush to the assumption it's consuming 120 volts times 1 amps of power, but this is incorrect. We demonstrated that the transformer is in actuality consuming 119.0 watts of real power, of which 115.2 watts is passed on to be put to beneficial use. Only a measly 3.6 watts is considered a loss. In this case, the transformer is not 100%, but rather 115.2 over 119.1, or 96.6% efficient. 96.6% in my estimation is close enough to consider this device relatively ideal. Hold on, wait a minute, some of you may say. Where did that extra 14.6 VARs go? Why isn't this transformer actually 115.2 over 120, or 96% efficient. Here's the reason why. Long story short, the 14.6 VARs went nowhere, but rather it was regularly consumed and returned or exchanged through the power supply and didn't actually contribute to the actual real power transfer of the transformer. The reactive power interchange solely went to the establishment of the magnetic field necessary for the proper operation of the transformer, as did the reactive power consumed by the motor. Really, efficiency only affects the proportion of real power transfer between devices or stages of a larger electrical system, and not the transfer of apparent power. As an additional example of efficiency, let's return to our previous motor example. Recall that the loaded motor consumed 119.3 volt amperes of apparent power at an angle of positive 32.9 degrees, or a power factor of 0.84. This means the motor consumed 100.2 watts of real power and 64.7 volt amperes of reactive power. Let's say, however, the motor did only 86 watts of actual mechanical work and 14.2 watts was lost to heat, friction, and or noise. In this scenario, the motor would be 86 over 100.2, or roughly 85.8% efficient. This is where I like to think of power factor and efficiency both as hoops through which input apparent power has to jump one after another to yield usable output real power. If apparent power is to be considered a theoretical maximum in which there is no phase shift between voltage and current and all power is assumed to be positive, power factor is the first hoop through which apparent power must jump to yield real electrical power delivered to that device. Reactive power while an important dimension of apparent power and undoubtedly essential to the operation of devices like motors and transformers, both of which require magnetic fields to operate, is excluded from consideration by this first power factor hoop. Efficiency, the second hoop, shaves off all real power losses like heat, friction, and or noise from real electrical power input and yields real power output. Again, old school power calculation methods are extremely barbaric, but extremely effective. Consider a device that consumes one kilovolt ampere of apparent power as a power factor of 0.9, an efficiency of 95%. Jumping through the power factor hoop, the input real electrical power is 900 watts. The 435.9 vars of reactive power, while essential to the device's operation, is excluded from consideration. When real power jumps through the efficiency hoop, it yields 855 watts of usable power output where 45 watts have been lost to heat, friction, and or noise. Let's come at this from yet another direction. Consider a motor nameplate that explicitly states a motor produces 400 watts of real mechanical power output and has a 0.87 power factor and is 92% efficient. This means for the motor to yield the desired 400 watts of output mechanical power, it necessitates at least 400 over 0.92, or 434.8 watts of real electrical input, of which 34.8 watts is lost due to inefficiencies. This additionally means that this motor must consume 434.8 over 0.87, or roughly 499.8 volt amperes of apparent power. The 246.4 VARs of reactive power, while essential to this motor's operation, is excluded from consideration by power factor. Is power factor synonymous with efficiency? No. No, it is not. Apparent power is composed of two dimensions, real and reactive, both of which are necessary for the proper operation of an electrical device. Power factor, 
merely removes a reactive portion from consideration for the purposes of efficiency calculations. All right, that about concludes this series of illustrated examples. In conclusion, this lecture examined applications of AC power calculations by way of a series of illustrated example problems. If your self-assessment indicates you are so qualified to move on, by all means, do so. If, however, you struggle with these example problems, I recommend you revisit and review this material since AC power calculation will become an important technique in remaining AC circuit analysis scenarios. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.